And there's some things that I've learned in working with people who don't like reading or who struggle with it that I'd like to share with you. I think they're really important. Reading is intensely emotional because when we're learning new skills and new information, we store the emotional environment and our feelings right along with that information. So every time we retrieve those new information or skills, we retrieve the emotion as well. And I think that explains why so many people have math phobia or they get so upset about reading. When you're little and the teacher gets frustrated or the parent gets frustrated or impatient and you're a little kid, you perceive that as you're bad or you did something wrong. Your brain then switches to survival mode because you don't want to be in danger. You want the adults to take care of you. So cognitive uh, functioning stops. Learning can't take place. Then the next time somebody says, let's read a book, you retrieve those emotions and we have a problem. This continues. Same thing goes with math. So, we need to create positive experiences surrounding books. When I'm dealing with high school kids who hate reading, we don't start reading immediately. We do a lot of activities with books that don't involve reading because they associate reading with a competition, a chore, and something they're going to fail. So we put a book on our head and see how far we can walk. We find a word in a book. We, we, we do things with the writing in the book, but we don't necessarily say, oh, we're going to read this story. How the brain learns. I've used this when I'm teaching teachers, and I have to tell you, when I start teaching teachers, one of the first things I ask them is to share their own experience of learning to read. And I always have people in their 30s, 40s, 50s who start crying when they talk about their experience in first and second grade. Reading is intensely emotional. So we really need to be careful when we're working with young readers that we don't turn them into lifelong non-readers. And the way we do that is by you know, having some compassion and again trying to create positive experiences with books. When kids have trouble reading, my first thing is to say, check the lights. Because more daylight equals more learning. And there have been many, many significant studies that support this. One study, and this one was really the most impressive to me, 21,000 students in 2,000 classrooms. They were in California, Colorado, and where was it? Oh yes, Washington. California, Washington, Colorado. Because they had similar climate, similar amount of daylight, similar ethnic background for the students, and similar economic situations, so that those weren't the factors. And what they found was really incredible. During one school year, the kids in the sunniest classrooms achieved up to 26% faster in reading in one year. And when they improved the lighting in the darkest classrooms, they saw a 7 to 20 percent increase in the learning from math. That's, those are really impressive statistics. And there's another study. This one, 8,000 students. And they showed that classroom windows, the amount of natural daylight was just important as the ability of the teacher, the number of computers, and the amount of time the kids spent in school. Some people have what's called scotopic sensitivity. It means a sensitivity to light. There are, um, these are two websites I recommend going to. Both of them have a lot of information about the effects of light on reading. They also sell overlays that you can put on the page, which I have seen make a dramatic effect on students' ability to read. These are two sample overlays. They come in a lot of colors. Blue, purple, gray, seem to, and peach, or, or sort of a gold, seem to be the most popular colors with students. But I have actually seen students who would take four of these transparencies, and when they layer them, they're so dark that I can't even see through them, and they become readers. And these were often people who had spent years in school refusing to read, and then I actually saw those people instantaneously become readers. It's like putting sunglasses on your book. When you go outside, it's too bright. We want sunglasses because it makes our eyes feel better. If you put these over the book, it makes your eyes feel better. It has nothing to do with how smart you are. It not only makes reading easier, but I have seen immediate and long-lasting permanent changes in behavior, even from people who had been in special ed for being authority defiant or behavior disordered or whatever it was for years. When they got those overlays, they instantaneously became readers. Now sometimes people have dyslexia as well as a light sensitivity. In that case, we have to address the light sensitivity or the interventions for dyslexia may not be successful. Somebody may have 20-20 vision and still have light sensitivity. So if we just give them a vision test, 
it's not apparent that the problem is. But what you'll see with, with students who have light sensitivity, when they start to read, they fidget, they touch their eyes. Some of them will actually say, I have a stomach ache, I get a headache. Some of their eyes will get bright. I've read. I've had students who's actually had tears run down their faces whenever they tried to read under fluorescent light. The problem with fluorescent light is you can't get all the colors of the spectrum unless you buy full spectrum fluorescence. So when you have the regular tube light, it takes some of the color out of the spectrum. That creates a problem with contrast. Then in school, we have books with glossy pages. That glare can cause problems. It creates too much contrast. The other thing is fluorescent lights flicker. And even though most people's brains say, you know, deal with it, a lot of our brains are aware of the flicker and it becomes very uncomfortable and it actually interferes with our perceptual process. On the Erlen website, which I particularly like, you can go here to these little boxes and you can change the background color of the page. You can also go over here to where it says view sample distortions and you can see what it might look like to a young reader. This page, for example, I clicked gray. So I, you can see what happens when the contrast is less vivid. And this is an example of what it would look like if it's blurry. You can see that some of the letters are moving. This is why a lot of times people who have light sensitivity are misdiagnosed as dyslexic because they'll say the letters are moving. So we think, oh, the letters are flipping around. So I, again, as I said, they could have both, but they may just have light sensitivity. And again, the studies show that about 50% of people who are labeled as learning disabled are not. They have a light sensitivity. Magic Eye website. I highly recommend it because it's a sort of an unofficial, unscientific way to find out if people have astigmatism, lazy eye, uh, double vision, some problem, light sensitivity. Because I found that people who can't see the 3D images embedded in the Magic Eye pictures, there's something going on. So obviously I'm not an eye doctor, I'm not a specialist, but I can say, okay, I think there's a perceptual problem going on. Now we know at least what we're trying to solve. Magic Eye, if you're an old fart like me, you remember, they have a, a picture, a computer-generated picture, and inside, if you let your eyes go out of focus, you get a 3D image. I can't, I, I can't teach you how to do it, but on the Magic Eye website, you can pick the, the uh, fun with 3D. You can go to vision3d.com. It shows you how to see 3D, what if you can't see it, um, different optical illusions, all kinds of ideas. But then down here, it has visual health, and it goes into learning. So there's a, a wealth of information here. Dee Tadlock wrote the book Read Right after her son wasn't able to learn to read. She was a reading specialist. She couldn't teach him. She went back to college, studied the brain, came up with a new way of teaching reading. Phonics doesn't work for everyone. And her method works for a lot of people. I just recommend it as one of the ways that we can try to help those readers. Right brain children in a left brain world. Jeffrey Freed maintains that most ADHD kids are gifted. We just haven't learned how to unlock their potential. So he has suggestions here for teachers and parents. Making the brain-body connection is really important. The basic idea is we have a median in our body and we want to cross our legs and arms over that median. What it does is helps integrate our left and right brain hemisphere function and of course that supports learning and reading. These are the books I'm working on now, books for kids. I'm trying to write books that have some literary value, but also are books that will really be engaging to young readers. You can read about them on my website, alicebooks.com, and my regular website, luannjohnson.com. I'll show them to you. You'll find links to Magic Eye, National Reading Styles Institute, Erlen, over here. So you don't even have to type anything in. You can just go there and click these. My mother's name was Alice Shirley. She taught me how to read, and she taught me to love books. She died from breast cancer, so I created the pen name Alice Shirley Daughter, because I'm her daughter. And I use that name for writing my fiction, and then when I sell my books, I send some of the money that I make to breast cancer research in her memory. So that's why we have two names. But on both websites, I have the links to the vision and reading sites, because I think they're so important. So, happy reading.